Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. Eight weeks ago, we eagerly launched this podcast with the aim to bring you valuable content and thought-provoking conversations. As mentioned in the introductory episode, this is a work in progress, meant to be co-created with you. We truly appreciate any feedback you may have, including requests for topics you're interested in or guests you'd like to hear from. I'll leave a survey in today's show notes so that you can let us know your thoughts. I'd like to share a review left by Prague Rock 19. It reads, quote, This podcast shines a light on all the ways that people around the world are fighting against a lack of understanding, resources, and opportunity to create a world without borders for individuals with autism. End quote. Thank you so much for the support, Prog Rock 19. We are committed to helping create a world that is accepting of individuals with diverse backgrounds and abilities. Today's guest is Ryan O'Donnell. Ryan is a board-certified behavior analyst, videographer, and entrepreneur. Through quick and easy-to-digest YouTube videos, he makes behavioral science publicly accessible so people of all ages can experience their version of success. In the summer of 2019, Ryan collaborated with the Global Autism Project to document our training approach and highlight our partners at Kaizora Center for Neurodevelopmental Disabilities in Kenya. You can watch these videos on his YouTube channel, The Daily BA. In previous episodes, we've talked about how applied behavior analysis, or ABA, can be used to effectively treat individuals with autism. Given Ryan's passion for disseminating behavioral science and how often it is misunderstood, I thought he'd be the perfect person to come on the show and explain what it is exactly. Ryan provides a condensed history of behavioral science, from early controversial practices of behavior modification to modern ABA used in autism services, as well as relatable examples of its applications. Ryan also shares his experiences from working with the adult population and describes the different services that are available for families. In this episode, discover what's possible when behavioral science is creatively broadcasted. For more information about Ryan and the work he's doing, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. And now, I present you, Ryan O'Donnell. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on, Rachel. Yeah, welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thanks for joining us. Excited. I'd like to start with your background and how you got involved in the field, what your experience is with the autistic population. Yeah, so I graduated high school, went into just this exploration of trying to figure out what to do during undergraduate. And there was only one course that really piqued my interest after the first semester, and it was a psychology course. And so Psych 101 was interesting. I remember actually going back and telling my parents, and they're like, I never knew you'd be into something like that. And I was like, I'm going to just chase this. And it just so happened to be that the next course that I took was a Psych 205 Principles of Behavior course. And I just found it kind of like turned my life upside down. Like I enjoyed going to class and I was doing pretty well in it too. It was one of those things where it was usually one or the other in a bunch of different areas. And so I was like, I should probably keep pursuing this. And I had no clue where it was going to take me, that I was going to be doing this sort of stuff. Just totally stumbled into it. And so really it was completely accidental. I absolutely love it now though. And so I'm a behavior analyst. I spent about three different periods of my life either discovering and acquiring skill sets, starting to apply them in different ways, and now kind of running this weird media business that I do now. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit too. Just to tie in your involvement with the Global Autism Project, could you share when you first heard of the organization? Yeah. So it's one of those things where I've spent a lot of time online, social media, and I remember seeing different placements on Instagram or Facebook kind of talking about what they did and not knowing much there. Like I just knew of the Global Autism Project. And at some point I came across Molly's TEDx talk that she delivered. And I was like, I really resonate with what's being said here. Like I really enjoy this. 
And then it was one of those things where her and I talked on and off a little bit online. And I have a lot of relationships like these I form in the field with spending so much time on the internet is where <laughs> I get to kind of know somebody a little bit for like what they're doing, but I never really like really know what they're doing. And so there was an opportunity to get to know her better and what was going on that totally accidentally popped up, which was during the Pan-African Congress on Autism's conference. I was there working with another colleague, doing some international dissemination work. This was last year, right? Yeah. And Molly and I think a few people from the team were over there and we just happened to be like, hey, like we talk online and we're now in Kenya. This is weird. Like let's let's, you know, explore this further and chat more. So it's through some breakfasts and, and conversations and things like that at the conference where we I guess solidified. Like we really have the same value set and in ways kind of could maybe work together and complement each other with the stuff that I was doing, sharing some of the work that is going on the Global Autism Project. So it's this kind of weird evolution of find somebody online, happen to meet them. I never thought in my life, right, I'd be bumping into somebody I knew online in a conference in Kenya. Like that's just not words I ever thought I'd say in my life. And it shaped up into doing a little bit of work there. So she asked me if I could work on coming out and documenting a little bit of the things that you all do when it comes to the training prior to going out to all these different great locations. And so I went out to Brooklyn, spent quick three days just recording as much as I could to share videos afterwards of kind of the experience from the people that work there, the people that are going out on their first trip, people that have been working there extensively. It's just kind of thanks to her. I just kind of get this like blind faith, like record stuff and uh, make it happen. And like, that's where I love to operate. Um, and she was down for that. So yeah, that's the, I guess the short knew of her um, and the work that y'all were doing met, realized there was a really good connection there. And I love the work that they were doing. And then was like, Hey, I'd be really excited to share what y'all are doing in video. So we contracted and kind of made that happen. Yeah. I think that video is up on YouTube. It was some footage from orientation in Brooklyn, like you said, when we gather all of the teams together to send them off to their respective sites that they're visiting. So I'll post a link to that. Yeah, there's five or six videos. We'll make sure that we get them linked. Mm -hmm. And while you were in Kenya, you visited our partner site, Kaizora. What were your impressions of the work that they're doing there, especially coming from the U.S., having seen so many different ABA centers there? Yeah, I... I guess I made it a point in my career to hop around and find a lot of different perspectives of how people provided sort of behavior analytic treatment. And during the last couple of years, I've had the really cool fortune opportunity to be able to travel internationally and see what's going on out there. I guess first thing I like to tell people is it's always really cool to see the unique applications on how pretty much everyone's chasing the same goal, like helping people out. It might look a little bit different, but there's this really cool sense of sameness, like everybody in this field regardless of like your specific education or background, like you're chasing the same thing. And so I remember there talking with Molly about Kaizora a little bit and she invited me to go over there and check it out. And so when you walk through the doors, it's like this weird, like you feel kind of like, you know, people and what they're doing because everyone's chasing the same goal. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it was kind of like, oh, another center that's doing great work and let's explore and see what's going on here. And like some of the, the tools on how they're measuring and taking some of their data, I remember there specifically, and they're using this funky little chart that I really enjoy. And so, so I remember Pooja and I talking about the data collection system that they use. And I was just like, hey, that's what I use. So it's just like, I'm on the opposite side of the world where I've known you know, autism services and bam, we're both sharing in this passionate, engaged conversation about how you provide similar services with the same tools and things like that. So it's really cool to see the similarities there. And the passion's always the same as well. So I don't know, I, when I travel and I see some of these international centers and I 100% got it there at Kaizora, it was just, oh, great people chasing down this dream of trying to make a better life for people. The other side is there's entirely different systems that are set up across borders, as I'm sure people know, as to funding mechanisms, training, and things like that. And so the resourcefulness of centers that are usually outside of the US, but I feel like they're on this kind of like developmental trajectory. Like sometimes places that are just starting up or like autism reform is very new or the acceptance is very new. You see just extreme resourcefulness that you don't get out of places that have a little bit more abundance on those resources, whether that's time, staff, training, funds, things like that, right? Yeah. 
And so I always come back sharing with colleagues or finding myself during like podcast recordings like this, like thinking back and saying, hey, just as much as maybe we could share some useful things that we've learned or that we're developing in some ways here, we could also learn just as much the other way. Mm -hmm. And so it's always really interesting to talk to people internationally. And I remember Pooja there on just how they're doing as much as they possibly can with every second that they have, every dollar that they have, right? Yeah. And you see that, you see that. That's like, at least my understanding as a bit of an outsider of Global Autism Project, like you could see that was being carried out and that's like part of what everyone does there at Global Autism Project, right? Mm -hmm. Figure out how to get as much as they possibly can with the resources and the partnership that they have. Yeah, for sure. And after going on these trips and coming back to your home country, it just helps you to not take things for granted, right? Like that you do have these materials that maybe people are having to make in other places. And it just makes you appreciate and also think outside of the box. Because when you go and you see how other people are doing things and how creative they're getting with what they do have, it just makes, well, from, for me, from my experience, it makes me go back and also try and just be innovative. Yeah, hundred percent. You can see, you can like see that happening. Mm -hmm. And so I sometimes like to rethink like what if I went back and did my experience and training over again, what would be really cool and having some sort of system where you had different placements at places and I get, it would be crazy, but having a placement internationally that gave you that sort of perspective, I think would only benefit an ABA therapist or someone that's in this sort of line of work, right? In the helping professions, because it gives you so much perspective and helps you appreciate what you have, I guess, and rethink what you have too, I think is the big part of it. Exactly. I'd like to offer our listeners a brief introduction to behavior analysis, kind of like a course 101. You know, we have a wide range in our audience of people who might not be familiar with the science. And I think just providing some basic information will help them understand the rest of our conversation. So how would you describe what behavior analysis is to, let's say, your next door neighbor? Like what's your elevator pitch? Yeah. So I usually try to describe it as just behavior analysis, the science of behavior, meaning that anything that anyone does, thinking, feeling, talking, writing, whatever it is that you're doing in your day-to-day, -day, we say can look at be looked at through a scientific lens. And the interesting thing there is there's a very individualized approach to really what is your goal? What are you, you know, struggling with or trying to achieve in either of those, those domains? And we can help you get there through a number of different steps. So it's this very individualized approach to helping people with different areas of self-management or different areas of therapy or planning or prepping or goal setting. And it's really dependent on what it is that someone wants to do. I usually say that a lot of our work is in the area of autism, spectrum disorder, and related disabilities, but really the examples are all over the place. And it's really exciting. I know we'll get into some of those. Yeah. Could you just give some examples, like everyday examples of how behavior analysis is used? Yeah. So I'll do everyday examples, but also just really cool, weird ones where you're like, I had no clue that happened. And so it's about 85 or 90% of behavior analysts right now work in autism spectrum disorders and that sort of line of work. And the other areas that are really interesting, one of them that comes to mind is uh, tag teach, teaching with acoustical guidance. So it's just a very simple way to set up a audible noise that tells people when they're doing things correctly. And so this has been used not only in sports and helping train athletes and things like that, but also surgeons. So there's actually an NPR piece on how they're using this with surgeons. And part of that is, is we get so wordy. I'm doing, I feel like I do it on this podcast. Like you get so wordy with how you're trying to describe things and say things right? Whereas they just found the simple procedure of rather than trying to tell people how to do it and when to do it, if you can cue when those things are happening correctly, you can get a lot of learning very quickly. And so there's a lot of little simple examples like that. One of them was uh, about, what was it, six or seven years ago now with the Ebola outbreak. There was this, I would say, like fear and worry from health professionals of when we come into contact with someone, we want to make sure we're providing services. This is values conflict, right? But also the death rate and the contraction rate of that was very worrisome for people. And so there's a couple of behavior analysts that developed what we call a task analysis, series of steps that was foolproof, really. At the end of the day, if you followed these steps, you would not be able to contract the virus 
and you'd be able to help people out. And it was one of those things where providing some quick analysis, training in those, and having the right connections, working hard to get it out there. It's now the World Health Organization's protocol as how things go. And so there's that one. And then I'll share, I guess, two more kind of everyday examples or cool examples as well. One of them is there's these issues, and it's relevant internationally, there's these issues as to how do you provide solutions when you might not have the same resources for what's been developed elsewhere. And so specifically like in Mozambique, there was a civil war and landmines that were strewn across the country as a result of it. And went as far as they put these landmines in educational settings and such. And so coming out of that war, there was a lot of demining that needed to go on. And the problem is they can take approximately two days for someone to clear a space about the size of a tennis court when you're going about with the, the it looks like those big, you know, bomb hazmat suits and metal detectors and trying to find things. And when you're talking about an entire country, it's centuries to be able to accurately and safely say that you're going to be able to do those sort of things. But there were some researchers that knew that rats had a really great sense of smell. The African pouch rat that was local to that area had a great sense of smell, was really perceived as a rodent, but they realized that they could domesticate, train them to sense and smell these sort of things. They're light enough to where they won't explode the landmines. And so they could set up a system that would only take about 20 minutes to clear that same amount of space. So it would take a human two to three days. And so it's this really cool, I guess, rethinking because of the science, nerdy science stuff that sometimes you hear or you find on there that really isn't, I guess, important to the everyday person that's getting treatment. But there's a lot of scientists that knew the nerdy things that go on as to how those things work, how to kind of program and build solutions like that, that then can be trained and deployed out there. And so Mozambique's one where they're now a mine-free country. They extended that into some tuberculosis testing, as well as now starting to explore how to identify in places that were struck with, say, an earthquake or there's a hurricane or something where there's a lot of rubble and there's a lot of sorting out that needs to be done. Teach them how to go out and find people that need assistance so that we can direct our you know, recovery resources a little bit more effectively. So there's these really weird things that seem like they do not connect whatsoever, but it's just looking at and understanding how behavior works, what kind of the principles are that affect it, and then figuring out how we can kind of leverage our resources with that line of thinking to help people out. Um, the applications are all over the place. So yeah, it's really, really fascinating. I know I said I'd give two, and that was one. The last one I'd say is there's a lot of work actually that was done in the space race when trying to help people safely get to the moon and whatnot. And the two things that were done there was, first of all, there was a lot of very, I would say, quote, macho people that were being put in positions that needed to excel and be perfect at what they were doing and executing during the first space race. And they're arguing, fighting with each other. And so there's a couple of behavior analysts that went in and just developed some quick procedures on here's how you start to get some behavioral indicators of who's going to work well together. But the cool thing they also did is they also worked on building in some of the awareness that we should have more than just certain types of people going up there, but a breadth. So the reason that educators and other scientists and engineers and people outside of those military backgrounds are a part of that now is because of that kind of advocating of, hey, we should have a breadth of knowledge and people that go on these sort of trips. So yeah, I don't know if that makes sense to the listeners on how you can connect all those dots, but there's a nerdy science that does all this. It's all kind of the same, I would say, like code on the back end of how people think about it. But just like any other app, like you see totally different apps and applications that are out there and they look totally different, but it's all written off the same thinking and code, right? Yeah. And just to give another example that might be a little bit more relatable to people and their everyday lives, I would add habit tracking. Like you mentioned, self-management. And this type of self-monitoring system can really be effective for some people. Like I used to track how much water I drank, how often I exercised, and how often I read books. And just the act of checking the boxes was so satisfying for me. (laughs) And eventually I saw the behaviors increase because I loved seeing a full week of uninterrupted check boxes. Yeah. And that goes back to kind of like why I got into the field. I realized it was something I could do in a bunch of different ways if I, my interest changed, which I really liked. I liked that it was always a helping profession sort of role. That was just like a bonus there. And then the double bonus was I could apply this in my own life. And I was just like, this sounds like the best of all worlds. I could change jobs if I wanted to use the same thing, help people out, help myself out. Like, why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
How do you think behavioral analysis could be used during our current climate of COVID-19? That's crazy. So I think the first thing is like that self-management goal setting piece. We have a lot of research in areas that ways that we've helped people in the past. Part of the issue is there's not enough of us for even the demand and need of say an autism work. Like there's there's a lot of need for professionals. So we're kind of always under the gun of being able to help the number of people that need help. And part of that is we have these procedures, but we don't have all the best ways. We haven't translated them necessarily for everybody to kind of use in their day-to-day. And so I look at situations like right now as to how can we help people? We can help people with self-management, goal setting. A big area that's popular now is this area of acceptance and commitment therapy, which is helping people realize like the situation that you're in is a product of a lot of different reasons. You might not necessarily be able to change it right now, but what can you do to sort of reset your path and start to move forward? And that stuff's like really relevant right now. Um, if people wanted a book, I guess, maybe on how to start, I always feel like if I talk about these things, don't offer solutions, it's very weird, but there's a book called Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. That's still 100% relevant and could be used today to think about, you know, what's going on in your life of the pandemic and how can you move forward. Who wrote that? That's like the grandfather of ACT. (laughs) Yeah. So Steve Hayes. Steve Hayes. There we go. Yeah. And really that's just clarifying your values, what it is that you'd like to move towards, setting goals, how to set goals appropriately, and then how to move forward. So with your daily actions. So you're talking about your daily water intake, maybe. Yeah. That's a daily behavior that you're saying that you can check. From there, you'd set goals of, I want to have my check marks across the entire week, or maybe something that's individualized for people. It might be, you know, five or six out of your seven days a week. And then the cool thing about that is your behavior, your goals, if you're achieving them, starts to line up with your overall value of, say, health or healthy behavior and these sort of things that you're trying to chase after. So I feel that those ways of thinking can really help people during this time. And for the most part, that's realizing we're all disrupted, some more significantly than others. And what you thought you might have been trying to achieve or chase or how life was, it's time to rethink that a little bit. Not that you have to set those behind forever, but you have to rethink things. Like I was talking with a colleague that I kind of somewhat mentor last week and all the goals that he had set in January were not achieved in April. And it was a follow-up discussion around that. And the framing was really you know, I didn't achieve and didn't do the things I wanted to do. And I was like, your world completely turned upside down. (laughs) So what did you achieve along the way there? But now it's time to reframe your goals as to what you're doing right now. And so we do a lot of goal setting work and there's always data and measurement towards that. So I think that's one area that behavior analysis could really offer. And we have some people that can offer those sort of things, some tools like that one that I shared before. But we have more work to go, I think, also in in setting these up. One of my kind of career goals would be set up a really great self-management course that's fueled off of behavior analysis, but doesn't have any of the technical jargon. It's on the list. It'll get done sometime, but. (laughs) Yeah. I'd like to talk specifically about applied behavior analysis or ABA, because it has a really mixed reputation in different parts of the world, including the U.S., with relation to autism services. And I think it's important to look at history and acknowledge past interventions that may not be done anymore because of changes in social norms. Could you talk about how behavior analysis has evolved over the years? Yeah, your kind of really condensed quick history is that it came about as a lot of different weird areas of research in the late 1800s and early 1900s over about a 40-year period. And the big thinking there was, There was so much looking in to this sort of introspective, what's going on internally, thinking about your different subconscious, conscious states, things like that, that there was a really big swing. And what behavior analysis was trying to do is really look at the external environment, what was influencing your behavior from that. So environment for us is anything that's not what you're doing, is how I usually like to describe it. So anything that's potentially around you and your immediate environment, but also culture, your genetics, your learning history, all of these things can influence things. But there was a period of, I would say, decades of really nerdy experimental research, primarily with non-humans. We're talking about rats, pigeons, and a lot of very, I would say, highly controlled, very specific, and usually in very prestigious places. Skinner was the main person that kind of shaped this field, and he was placed at Harvard for most of his career. And so I guess it, it felt like this very ivory tower, very contradictory way of approaching psychology. 
And what happened there is almost like this kind of counter swing that happened in the, the 60s and 70s, which was behavior analysis was working very well for certain applications. And this was in understanding a lot of different ways in which human behavior evolved and I guess was influenced through reinforcement, punishment, things like this. But it wasn't doing a fantastic job in some areas of, like, say, mental health. And part of that was, is there was a lot of research that needed to be done. It was, people were, during this time were figuring out where it worked, where it didn't work, this sort of thinking. And so the swing back from that was really, I would say like this, not like an anti-ABA movement, but it was kind of a, let's go back and look at thoughts, feelings, urges, and, and see what role those sort of have. And that was dominant for quite a while as well. And there was a couple different things that happened there, like this new kind of dominant theory that was coming in of cognitive behavioral therapy. And there was no set standards for who could call themselves a behaviorist or a behavior analyst. There was no set training of like what experience you needed to have. And there was a lot of experimental stuff that was going on in the sense of, could we apply this sort of thinking in different ways? So this is where like the work of Ivar Lovas started to shape up for early intensive behavioral intervention for children with autism. And we'll kind of come back to that in a second, but there was also more controversial therapies. One of them that I always like to acknowledge was there was an actual conversion therapy that was developed, experimented with in the 70s. The goal there was to convert people from, say, what was perceived as like homosexual tendencies into something else without their, um, with maybe like parental or guardian consent, but really that was one thing. The entire community actually came against that and said, this is not something we should be doing, but it tainted the field, rightfully so, but it was something that was done there. What happened with that? Yeah. So with that, it never developed into like a program or like a service that continued on, but it's one of those things where the actions of a select few can taint and the rest of the community moving forward. And so it's talked about sometimes as to look at what this field's done. And the big thing there is this field doesn't do that anymore. It hasn't for, I don't know, going on 40 years now or something like that. And the professional communication around that time was this is unacceptable and shouldn't be happening. And so I would say in the behavior analysis community, it is completely not accepted in today's day and age and looked at as, I would say, a failure in some of our training systems and peer review sort of systems and things like that. Yeah. I think also we have to remember the social context of when that happened and what people were thinking about homosexuality in general. Like now, 40 years later, we have a much different attitude about homosexual rights, thinking about how people are reacting so strongly now to things that happened before, when not really thinking about what was going on in people's minds back then. Like it's so easy to just judge from our point of view. 2020, what was happening back then? Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought up that context because it was totally different. The development of behavior analysis was over a hundred years, roughly, in totally different context, what we're used to, a period of this extensive research. And that was kind of the culture of what you did, trying to figure out how to help people when people realized they could help people out. Some of that going down avenues that were really helpful, like what is transformed in the early intervention work with children with autism can be very beneficial when people are trained right and implemented correctly. And then there's some couple of weird offshoots that were just totally inappropriate like that one. But I would say what largely happened there is there was this characterization of procedures that kind of worked sometimes, other times didn't. And this was really called behavior modification back then. So this is where if people want to think back to Clockwork Orange, or if they want to think about some of these examples, this behavior modification is what sometimes people think about. Someone is trying to influence, control your behavior and things like that. And my stance on that and what's agreed upon in the literature is like those were a set of procedures and ways to try to approach it. But it was before we really understood how to provide like great treatment. So there's some really big advancements done in the mid 80s, early 90s on how to really set up procedures that help people achieve what they wanted to, but also did it in ways in which were, I would say, much more seamless. A lot of the behavior modification procedures were very reliant on punishment procedures or things that might have been seen as inhumane or just, I don't know, like aversive interventions. Yeah, aversive things they didn't like. Like it works, but it didn't make people walk away feeling like I got help. It was more so like someone set me straight. Yeah. We learned how to flip that to where it was completely reinforcement based sort of approaches. And so the behavior analysis that you read about oftentimes, if you try to Google and look around, if 
if it's equated to behavior modification procedures and things like that. We've advanced 30 years, which may not seem like a lot, but it's actually a ton when you think about the amount of human intellectual capital and things that have been going on in the last 30 years as this field's been rapidly expanding. And so if you run across behavior modification or ways in which people are describing behavior analysis, it's often either outdated or there's kind of these components that people are missing that are now a part of what we do. Yeah. But I do want to point out that this has been a process, right, over the last 30, 40 years. So in between that, there have been people who have had services, maybe even 20 years ago, who still had that kind of stringent, like really strict ABA and who are now adults traumatized. And, you know, rightfully so. Yeah. And unfortunately, even today, there are still clinicians who are unethical, who cut corners, who might be in it just for the money, but you'll find this in any service industry, really. You will. And I mean, I know they're out there because I found them when I was looking for a job. And luckily at that point, I had enough experience to know what good ABA is and what bad ABA is. But it's important, I think, to just keep these kinds of conversations going to bring awareness to the changes, especially for families who might be considering ABA services, but find all kinds of misguided information on the internet. Yeah. There's this behavioral researcher in our field, Greg Hanley, that talks oftentimes about things should be televisable and this sense of anything that we're doing should look great, feel great, and leave people with that perspective. And I think that's a fantastic difference. If it doesn't feel like that, then it's not modern behavior analysis. And the really cool things there too is the way in which we've built in like choice procedures and things like that. Whereas things used to be closed door, we're going to work with you for two, three, four hours and help you on your goals. It might not look great. Now there's a lot of like open door analyses where it's, hey, if we're as a therapist not able to help and engage this child, for example, in a way in which they want to be here with us learning these skills or, you know, whatnot, then we're failing, right? Like we should have these conditions. So I would say it swung completely different. And like you said, there was a number of different institutional things that shaped up. So I'd mentioned up there was no formal training systems and things like that. A lot of work done in the 70s and 80s and 90s led to really great ethical boards, committees, the development of not only our minimum certification standards for the board certified behavior analyst roles and other roles like that, but also this two-way communication between researchers and practitioners is starting to shape up. And so it used to just be dominated from the researchers kind of informing things. The practitioners are now dominating for the vast amount of people that are out there and helping say, like, this is what we need research and figured out. And so it's been flipped on its head completely, not only in the ethical way in which we approach things, but professionally as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what we as behavior analysts have a responsibility to do is to educate families and the general public of the types of services that are available out there and what to look for in those services. Mm -hmm. So I'd encourage parents to do their research, ask around, and even ask other families what their experiences have been like with a particular agency. And if they feel like something's not right about the interventions or they're not seeing progress, then to speak up and have a conversation with their team. 100%. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I'd like to go a little bit deeper into your experience working with adults. Could you tell us about some of the services you were offering? How old were the clients and what were some of their outcomes? For sure. So when I said that I got interested in the field, I begged my first professor for about six months. I'm like, how do I get a job placement and something like this? And so he referred me to a local day program for adults with intellectual disabilities. I worked there for about two and a half years. And that was where, again, I never thought I'd be doing that sort of line of work, really enjoyed it. And I was helping produce like really cool outcomes in somebody's life. And most of these adults were anywhere from 18 to, I would say, 65 years old. And so there was a breadth of diagnoses, how impacted they were by their disabilities. It was very eye-opening. And I realized that behavior analysis can be used to help people out, that there was this entire helping profession field that I really resonated with, but also that there was this community of people that I hadn't necessarily come in contact with, maybe once or twice when I was younger, but I never realized just how vast the network of people were that needed help that had diagnoses like this and things like that. And so for me, it really set this new perspective on, holy cow, like in America, there's millions of people that are impacted to this sort of degree or varying degrees, right, that need services like this, that I just naively just didn't know was there. And so I've worked with adults for a number of different organizations over my career. I'd say I'd spent about five or six years out of the 10 years working with adults. 
It's always been really great work to help people out. It's really tough work if anybody works in that area. You're dealing with a lot of learning history and a lot of lack of resources. And I just want to acknowledge anyone that's out there, like it's very trying work to go out and help this population. But it also set really clearly for me the importance of any work that we do at the early intervention level. You see the potential struggles that someone's going to run into if you're working with adults down the road, if you're not teaching some very basic communication skills, if you're not teaching very basic activities of daily living, going to the bathroom, things like that. The first skill I worked on, and it took a long time, was working with an adult about 38 years old, spoke four or five words was all for his entire life. We were teaching him how to wipe his butt and how to wash his hands at 38 years old. Like that skill set wasn't mastered by that time. And so the number of people that didn't want to interact with him or get close to him as a result of this poor hygiene was just heartbreaking. And that's where, you, like fortunately and unfortunately, like that situation, so unfortunate for that, that person, we helped help them out. Can't think about that, you know, 35 years or whatever it was that he struggled with that. But also there was never a situation in which I wasn't completely advocating for and making sure that we taught proper skills at a younger age with different clients as a result of that, right? Mm -hmm. Because of that. So I would say the the types of services real quick that are available out there for anybody is there's a lot of this kind of one-on-one or small group work, teaching skill sets in a variety of different ways. It could be those activities of daily living. Typically those things are taught in a couple of different ways. Either people come into a center, like what we were doing with that individual. They hang out there for three to six hours, typically learning some sort of individualized skills, or there's this uh, entire network of kind of job networking and job skills training that's going on. And this is really cool because it was lacking in the early infrastructure, the, I'd say the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But this is looking to help people develop skill sets for all sorts of different work. A lot of it's typically in light manufacturing. So here in Reno, we had some contracts with the companies that designed the gambling systems, the different slot machines and such. And so we would teach skill sets, basic skill sets in these environments of how to show up on time, how to get along with your coworkers, you know, uh, depending on the, the dexterity and the skills that they could do, how to help build some of these sort of things up. But the goal there was if people wanted to stay in that sort of light manufacturing system, then cool, they could. But that was really a stepping stone to build those basic skill sets so that they could start to apply for other jobs, temporary, part-time positions, usually in different sectors and obtain a job that was... I would say uh, they call it usually job coaching, where your job is you're doing that job. You might have someone that's coaching one, two, three, four hours a week max, but you graduated from that model of having somebody there, you know, 30 hours a week helping teach you these skill sets into those sort of job coaching programs. And so those are a couple models that are out there. People do them a little bit differently, but it's typically one of those two approaches day program, job and skills training, and then some sort of job coaching program. And then We realized at that time too, the last service model that I've seen popping up in the US quite a bit was this transition period. When you transition from graduating high school into what's next was really unclear for people. And there's no, there wasn't a lack of infrastructure there. So oftentimes we'd find ourselves with a parent that's done 18 years of, or sometimes 18 to 22 years, depending on where you're at, of just unbelievable advocacy, day-to-day work of helping their child get every possible opportunity that they can. And they come in like, all right, he's graduating. You know, we want him to be in your day program or tour around and check it out. And I'd be like, have you been a part of getting your name onto this system and kind of getting started in this, uh, you know, state ran system? And they'd be like, no. And when I heard that, it was heartbreaking because I always knew it was about anywhere from a six to 12 month lag of going into those doors to be able to receiving services. And so this happens all over the place and all over the world where the systems stop at some point, the funding mechanisms and things like that. And so what we'd worked on doing, the federal government set up some cash to help make this happen. But I think anybody could go out there and do a similar sort of approach, which was we started working with school districts on what they called pre-employment transition services, which was part instruction of saying, here's the options in your local community of what's next, depending on what your goals are, giving a little bit of self-advocacy skill sets and goal setting skill sets as well during a quick push-in program, as we call it, where we went into the schools and we taught these to anybody that had a disability on record. And it was really meant there to inform and help them out, but also hand off resources to any parents or guardians at that time too, of saying, here's what's next. Not here's what's next on what you're going to do, 
that's up to you all and the goals that you want to set. But here's the opportunities that are available like in our local valley, right? And so that's a big one that I've been seeing shape up. When I visited a center over in Cairo, Egypt, they set up almost verbatim like a very similar thing because they saw the same issues were going on. So to kind of relate it back to, I was talking about international work, all these cultures and experiences that people have are so vastly different, but there's some very big similarities when it comes to you know how our kind of governments are structured and how we help out that in the nitty gritty might be really different, but people are needing the same types of services, right? At the, or, or the same type of help at similar periods in their life, right? Yeah. And so that was, I guess, some of the models that are here in the States and why I love that work and anybody that does that sort of work just because it's so needed, right? Yep. I've visited locations where people don't get services very much, or if any, when they're young, but then when they're older, they hang out in a house for the rest of their life. They're overseen by parents or guardians, or it's shunned, right, to have them out in the community and just heartbreaking. And yeah. so that, that adult work gives you a sense of why we work so hard in the early intervention. And there's a lot of finalization and fixing those systems still that needs to go on. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great takeaway for practitioners. When I used to write programs for my younger clients, I would always think 10 years ahead. Like, what's possible for this kid when he's 18, 20, 25? Like you said, what functional skills can we teach them now to help prepare them for independence? Because these cute kids that we work with now are going to grow up into adults, and it's our responsibility to help them out with that. Yeah. So, Ryan, you have a YouTube channel, The Daily BA. Tell us about that. What made you decide to start making videos? For the most part, it was uh, I was up all night watching a particular YouTuber, and I thought it was the most pompous, weird thing when people were vlogging. So this idea of video blogs, right? Record your life on a camera, walk around, share it with the world. I was like, this is the most ridiculous thing. But I just kept clicking in every night, clicking in, and I just like watched this next video, the next video, the next video, the next video. And the next morning at work, after like staying up all night, I was like, why did I do this? And it had me thinking also of like. You know, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm a cat guy. I like, I, I like cats and dogs, but like cat viral videos, right? That you see on YouTube and things like this. Like, yeah. why Why do these things get millions and millions of views? Like uh, our field, for example, has got such great outcomes and things that we've done. Like, why don't we get the same sort of virality, right? Of the work that we're doing in these helping professions is kind of what made me think of this. And I realized that the only way to really pursue that was to pick up a camera, start playing around with it. And I realized just how hard it was to make a great video that people resonated with. And so it was this thing I kind of dabbled with for six or nine months, thinking about recording some stuff on a GoPro when I was out in my day to day, trying to learn some skills. And I have this rule, I guess, in my life, which is if you're thinking about it and you're not really full committed on it, you either need to let it go or you need to go full committed. <laughs> and so <laughs> on, a, on a flight back one day with my family, it was roughly around the new year. And I was like, you know what? I just need to, I need to chase this for a while. And so the Daily BA was that. It was a place for me to upload a daily video about behavior analysis. They're not daily. I do not live up to the name. <laughs> but it was to create this system that forced me to upload something and get better and see if it was valuable to an audience, if it resonated with anybody. And uh, it served that purpose. It went from experimental and kind of uploading videos to where I, I keep doing that. I feel like they're a lot better. They're getting better at least. And uh, it's really led to opportunities like this that right now as we're recording. Because uploading those videos, one of my colleagues invited me out to a few different trainings that they were doing. It was Megan Miller. Megan Miller was the one that invited me out over to the Kenya Pan-African Congress event that was going on, why I met Molly. The video, my approach there is usually just squeeze any opportunity I can potentially get someone to say yes to on the road. And so when Molly was like, let's go check out Kaizora, I was like, could I turn this into an episode or something I put on the <laughs> internet? And she's like, oh, yeah, as long as it's good, you know, like, let's, you know, um, that, those weren't her exact words, but like, that's usually the vibe I get from people, you know, it's like, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. Right. And so yeah, Pooja and the episode that I did with Pooja was just a result of me kind of chasing those opportunities. And so that shaped into, I have a, I would say a production studio now, which is really just a team of one and sometimes some contractors to help people record and kind of market, share their story, whatever it is that they kind of need in these helping professions. And then I still continue to upload on there as much as I can to just create hopefully useful videos about behavior analysis that are interesting. Yeah. 
And they are. They are super useful and very interesting. And I really appreciate the way you approach the topics in your videos. Like you make them relatable and easy to digest. And it really offers this fresh look on the science delivered through a medium that can be really effective in disseminating behavior analysis. Thank you. I appreciate the kind words there. I always tell people that the little comments are what stoke the fire and keep me going on that. Because <laughs> um, the back end, like a three minute video, I can work sometimes for six, 12, 14 hours on sometimes just to kind of perfect and whatnot. So it's a lot of work. There's a saying by that founder in behavior analysis, B.F. Skinner, which is when you run into something interesting, drop everything else and study it. And so that was kind of video for me. Just like behavior analysis, never thought I'd be into it. The video aspect, it was clear that our field needed something like this. I don't think I'm going to be the one that does it all. Sure, hope not. But throwing some time into it since I was interested has led to some really cool opportunities in dissemination. Yeah. I can really relate to your whole creative process just in how I've got this podcast off the ground this last couple months. Yeah. You know, there's this, it's almost like a fear of exposing yourself. Like, this is me. This is my product. And it's up in public for people to judge and analyze and critique. And, you know, there's something about putting yourself out there that is exciting, taking that risk. Yeah. It's, uh, it's weird. It's almost been so long since I first started uploading and gotten all that nervous effect that I forget about it. I try not to. <laughs> you get a little numb to it, I guess. And that's, it's a good thing because it keeps you going forward, but it's also like, you don't want to get too numb to it because like that's because you're putting it out there and you're getting that feedback from everyone, right? If anyone's considering trying to put something out there, you don't have to go all the way to a public outlet, but I would encourage people to start sharing it out there because I never was this person in high school. I never thought I'd be the person that was doing this sort of stuff that I am now with the video sort of stuff. When I meet old friends and colleagues, they're like, you don't even seem the same, but it was just because of trying it out and testing it out, right? And realizing there's a lot of good that can come from this medium. And I actually want to emphasize that there's way more good that comes from putting things out there than there is bad. The bad might be noticeable, like a comment here or there, and might seem scarier, but it's overwhelmingly positive is what I've experienced. Yeah. I know one of your recent projects was to collect anonymous testimonies of the ABA community in response to COVID-19. And so many industries have been affected by the crisis, and the field of ABA is not an exception. And many companies have transitioned to a telehealth model while some are still requiring therapists to physically go to work because ABA therapy has been deemed an essential service. And these therapists who are still expected to enter their clients' homes and run sessions, hopefully taking some protective measures, have spoken up on your platform. Could you share some of those perspectives that were submitted? Yeah. So when the pandemic started, I actually talked with Molly and a few others about, you know, how big do we think this is going to get and impacting things? I would say in late February, early March. And it was pretty clear, pretty quick that a lot was coming down. And there was also this kind of gap. Like there's different, I would say, public figures in our field, whether researchers or people online. There's also these boards and different scientific organizations. And it was pretty clear that part of what was being missed was the people that are doing the day-to-day -day work were struggling, not sure what was going on, and didn't necessarily have all the guidance they were looking for. Like it was really dependent on the organization that you were working in and the experience of the leadership there. But there was like just this missing area of being able to vent, but also maybe get some feedback. So since I do a lot of stuff online, there's people asking me, you know, like, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? I think a lot of things, but I also know that I've never gone through a pandemic and understand what to do during this situation. So usually my default there is just like, let's open this up to a community in a, a safer way. So I collected some anonymous statements that people could fill out and just share knowing that they would be heard. They could click in and see what people had to say, but they didn't have to have their name on the line necessarily. And so there's a number of them on Instagram and Facebook. One of them was uh, some folks in Michigan were talking about how clinically their team decided that they were going to start shutting down services and, and offering telehealth, but they had a corporate, that's not going to happen, come down for some sort of reason. Now, I don't know the organization. I don't know the person that submitted this sort of stuff. So there's the caveat of someone could be making stuff up. I really don't think that was going on. But it was one of those things where a lot of people were resonating with, oh, like corporate and clinical aren't necessarily on the same path right now in trajectory. So it created a place for people to kind of discuss these sort of things. And there was another one that was a gentleman that talked about 
I've worked in various positions in emergency medical services and have also been trained in working with hazardous materials. And they talked about how the essentialness of what was being deemed as essential sometimes or being argued should not be right ethically above true emergency sort of situations. So when people are saying, you know, the student needs to master these math fact skills or these color discrimination procedures or whatever it is, because these are essential, those sort of things are being questioned as to what really is essential now. And I guess the biggest thing that came from this was it's an ethical discussion. Unfortunately, there's not a set path, whether you want to call it unprecedented times or an issue in ethics, but there's no, here's exactly what we're going to do. And so by sharing those, that actually had a couple effects on our local community, which was a couple different webinars and position statements that were put out by professional organizations trying to offer some guidance or saying, we can't guide you because of X, Y, and Z. So here's what you do next. So for example, our behavior analyst certification board that dictates the minimum competencies, they can only go so far on what they offer people during this time. And while they're typically one of the organizations that dictate and help explain as to how we can move forward as a field, they're limited in what they can do because of the role that they play legally in the United States. And so I guess that kind of mini campaign raised awareness of a lot of people are working directly with people with disabilities, we're struggling and not sure what to do. And so some of the roles and entities out there decided to start stepping up, creating more sort of stuff and sharing it out there. One of those was definitely Molly. Talked with her a number of times about what y'all were trying to do and webinars, talking with people, sharing right, things like that, right? Yeah. Um, that people were looking for. So I paused it and the sense of like, it's not a sustainable thing and I can't help the individual out. And so now we either direct towards an ethical body or there's a couple webinars and things that I point people to. Even in the way that you did it, it still gave people validation for what they were going through. And they were part of this community of other registered behavior technicians who are on the front lines and feeling the same things that they were feeling. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I think there's still a really big gap in having the registered behavior technicians or any of the direct care professionals. Like They don't have an easy way to say, here's how we're feeling, what's going on. It's very much a, a top-down approach. Uh, hierarchical sort of situation in our field. So I don't know, we need to solve that. Yeah. And that could be another podcast episode in itself. Yeah. But I do want to talk about your documentary that you just released called This Way of Thinking. I watched it and found it super interesting. I didn't know about Boys Town or even much about Pat Fryman before. Could you describe for our listeners the premise of the documentary? Yeah. So This way of thinking is really trying to communicate the power of thinking from a behavior analytic perspective without making it clear that it's the behavior analytic perspective necessarily. So oftentimes dissemination work in our field is saying, this is why you'd want to use this science and you have to use it like this. And it's very, I guess, authoritarian sort of sounding. So for this one, we just wanted to go about, could we create something that was just a very interesting story around what it would be like to potentially or feel like to receive behavior analytic services? And so there's this really unique place in Boys Town, Nebraska, where in the early 1900s, the Catholic Church and Father Flanagan set up a place for children with behavioral disorders. And the main, I guess, mini spoiler alert, the main approach there is that there is no bad child. It's circumstances that set these sort of things up. And so that way of thinking was not because he was in any way sort of interested in behavior analysis or knew about it. I have no clue on that. But it's also, I guess, a mantra in our field as well and a belief that we hold. And so Boys Sound is unique in the sense that they have a really well-designed program and infrastructure there for helping people out and achieving things in behavioral and mental health but they also resonate with the values of behavior analysis. So Pat Fryman's been the lead, I would say, PhD there over the clinical program in some sort of capacity for the last 25 years. I'd always read about it. We did a daily VA internet video that did really, really well. And so I asked him like, hey, could we pursue this further? I don't know what that would be. The stars aligned on everything from their marketing team, C-level execs to Pat Fryman, to a bunch of people being there, allowing us through the doors to kind of record everything and set it out. So that video is what it looks like if I work on a project for six months instead of six hours. I always tell people, if you go to the daily BA, you get a six hour video. That one's uh, what happens when you work for about six months on something. And yeah, it was our first, I would say, good attempt at trying to share what it would feel like if you re- received behavioral and mental health services from a very well-trained behavior analyst. It doesn't tell you how that happens or what that looks like. 
but we're building that out more and more and more. I think it's really informative for people who are not in the field also, because there are parts in it, and don't worry, I won't spoil too much, but (laughs) it just connects people to what it means to be a compassionate human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where can people watch it? Yeah. So we set it up on thiswayofthinking.com. Also, any of my daily PA channels and things like that have the trailers and things that are out there. The, The idea is that you're on location, that you feel as if you're there hanging out with these people. And so on location is our social handles, team on location, actually, is all of our social handles if people want to kind of see what's going on there. We actually created a podcast too. So like you'd said, we set it up in a pay model to try to recoup some of the costs and what we've done and try to make this sort of thing sustainable. But understanding the circumstances right now, there's a relatively cheap option, but even 10 bucks, I think is still a lot for some people or people think about that right now. So there is a podcast that describes and kind of shares a lot of information on how we got in this and started it out that's available freely as well. Yeah. All right. I'd like to close with just one last question. What advice do you have to professionals in the field who may be really excited about behavior analysis and want to accelerate the dissemination of the science? What's the best way to do this? I think you you have to try things over and over and over again. So just like how we help people in learning things and teaching them new skills through a lot of repetition and practice, and you see this in like professional sports too, right? I don't know if anyone's watching right now, like the last dance and you're like, uh, the the documentary with Michael Jordan, the Bulls and all that. Oh yeah. You can see just how much practice goes into like getting really great at something. And the creative endeavor is no different. Had I not started uploading stuff to Daily BA, the podcast that we do, things like that, until you get those repetitions in, you don't, I guess, get a full sense of whether or not your passion's there and love it, but also you don't develop the skill sets to get really great at it. So I get that it's scary. One thing that I try to offer is like, if anybody's like, hey, will you check this out and let me know what you think? Like, you can send me an email. But like, that's what I also do with others. I live that same process. Like, if I have something new that I'm trying out, like with the documentary, we showed it to a number of different people over feedback sessions for about three months because I don't know, I was like using a lot of skill sets and extending my skill sets farther than I had before. And so however you can get that feedback, if it's more comfortable for you to just go for it and upload it, (laughs) cool. But if it's one of those things that you need a smaller community, you can show, I don't know, your significant other, family, friend, you know, find someone and commit to learning whether or not you really enjoy the process through doing it over and over and over again, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you might fail at first and that's part of it, just embracing it and learning from it. Yeah. Well, Ryan, it's been so fun talking to you and I really admire your passion for ABA and hearing you speak is kind of lighting a fire in me too, to even continue with this podcast or just keep learning new developments within the science. So thank you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate the opportunity as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks. All right. Everyone out there, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Anyone affiliated with Global Autism Project, y'all do amazing work. I know it's crazy right now, but don't (laughs) stop. (laughs) Like, There's so many of us out there that like appreciate what you're doing. The world needs y'all. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. Whether you're in the field of behavioral science or just curious about it, I hope you found my conversation with Ryan as informative as I did. I would like to stress the importance of receiving autism services at an early age. Research shows that early intervention increases the likelihood of major long-term positive effects on symptom reduction and later skill acquisition. Examples of treatments include intensive language training, play-based modeling, and hands-on parent training. Such interventions occur from infancy to five years old. During these years, a young child's brain is still forming and is more adaptable than at older ages. Beginning treatment early will give children not only the best start possible, but also the best chance of developing to their full potential. As Ryan discussed, individuals who don't receive appropriate support as children will often face bigger challenges as adults. We must continue to spread autism awareness and acceptance around the world so that more parents are aware of their options, more professionals provide evidence-based interventions, and more children have access to services from an early age. The sooner a child gets help, the greater the chance for learning and progress. Thanks for listening. Take care. 
You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.